I get that, okay? So I will show you all of this amazing stuff, but I think it's amazing. Um, but I, I totally get, you know, a step up into a new technology is not easy. However, if it's something that you think, actually, this is a part of the architecture that we want to design for this challenge, definitely go in there and give it a go if you can. Um, the tutorials tend to give you a really good approach, and then you can swap it out for your data specifically. That's how I always think about these. So it's all about tooling to support your ideas. So think about what you're doing with your challenge and then go, yeah, actually, that might be quite useful. If there's something that I don't cover that you're interested in, I'm a bit of a workaholic, so all night long, I'll probably, I've already got one thing on my list to help someone out around um, Power Automate. Uh, so I'm going to see whether I can get something done with that tonight and share it with you tomorrow. So just feel free to ask me any question. I'm more than happy to help. So let's get started. Machine learning on Azure. I'm going to start with the shiny stuff. I was going to start with like the bread and butter, like the storage account, but I thought I might lose some of you. So I'm going to go straight in with the shiny tech to go, yeah, you want to come and use this. But basically, machine learning on Azure. There's a few different personas around machine learning, right? Machine learning for a data scientist, the tooling and the, the want, what do you want from a technology provider is quite different than from, say, a business intelligence analyst or a data analyst or something like that who actually do we want to spend time in Python do we want to spend all of our time at this hack learning about that kind of stuff probably not we probably don't have enough time that's a more considered thing a more considered approach and so I'll show you what some of the things you might want to consider trying to use and that could be a proof point to do further bespoke modeling so think of it as a spectrum we can come in and we can just use a service we can maybe tailor that service a little bit or we can completely build our own thing as well. So it's a real spectrum. So option number one. Option number one is all about, okay, I have an idea and we have this idea of pre-built AI. Pre-built AI is that Microsoft train this model. So think of text analytics, think of computer vision, what's in the image, what objects are in that image. Text analytics, can we extract key phrases? All of these types of things, they're actually not easy problems to solve still, um, so, but they're not impossible. So we kind of have stepped out of research now um, and into sort of small production level services. However, this is a great way for a developer or anyone who can write code and call a web request to easily be able to get intelligence without having to build a model and understand the underlying theory yourself. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, we've got an idea, we're going to use pre-built AI, and that will hopefully make our million dollar idea into a reality. Okay, so what is this called? These are called Azure Cognitive Services. So if you're interested in understanding more about text analytics, computer vision, speech to text, text to speech, um, video uh, analyzing, stuff like that, then this is definitely the type of tech that you want to be using. So let me show it you, because the best way to do anything is, I believe, is to show people what it looks like. So, da, 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 where are we? We're here. So when you type Azure Cognitive Services into Google, probably the first thing that's going to come up is this page, azure.microsoft.com slash services dash cognitive services. Cognitive services, as it says, are a family of AI services that do lots and lots of different things. And as we scroll down, what we can see is that it will tell us all about, you know, the marketing selling points and the tech person here. So I'm going to go past the marketing. And what I want you to look at is the actual services that we provide. So we can see down here, we have different categories, decision, language, speech, vision, and web. And so say if I went into vision, we can see the right of the page changes and it will tell us all the different things we can do. So we can say what's in an image. We can do custom vision, which we'll talk about in a very, very briefly in a moment. We can try and identify people or emotions in images. Forms Recognizer is one of the most popular preview services we've had for a while. If you have invoices or documents that have the same structure in them, but they're maybe physical or PDF type documents where you can't really get that data out of them, Forms Recognizer is an incredibly interesting way to start actually extracting the real data and value from those documents that has previously been considered dark data. So if you have a lot of invoices, this might actually not be in these challenges, but might be in your workplace. Uh, Forms Recognizer, come and ask me more about that because uh, we've done some cool stuff there. 
a ink recognizer, whether it's handwritten or digital, um, as well as things like video indexes, so not just images, but actually applying that to motion video as well. Um, so there's, there's loads of different things, right, under each one of these categories. But if we click on, say, computer vision, you can see what it does. Because it's just a web request, we've actually built it into the page. So here we can see, um, I actually think this is the London Underground. I think you can tell by this um, <laughs> that this is the London Underground, not somewhere else in the world. But basically, uh, you can select some of the pictures or you can actually search or browse your own pictures and try them out in here. But what it's doing here is it's showing what Oh, sorry, it keeps jumping. Um, what you can actually extract from the picture. So you can see it actually does some object detection and it'll tell you where in the page a person is or a skateboard is. But what is all of this craziness on the right? Well, this is basically JSON. So JSON format is a great way to share key value pair data. And what that is in this case is things like what objects are in the image. So these are the rectangle coordinates for the object skateboard. And then one of the biggest things in machine learning is this bit here, the confidence value. Confidence in machine learning, every machine learning model is a probability. Okay, so all machine learning or a computer is giving you is the probability of how, how correct it thinks it is, is the most general thing. There's actually a lot more to it than that. But realistically, it's saying I'm pretty confident when it's 0 0.903, so closer to one, it's saying I'm pretty sure that I've said that's a skateboard and it is a skateboard. If it's unsure, it might be at like a 0 0.5, a 0 0.4, closer to zero. And then you might go, mm, that, not, that not, might not be a good piece of information to pass back to my end user because the machine's not actually sure it's got it right. And what needs to happen is we need to train it a bit more. Okay? Or, or in this case, it's our service, so then you might have to look at doing a more bespoke model because it's maybe something that we haven't trained it on. But basically, what, the, what, what is happening here, because a lot of people then go, oh, I love that, but how do I actually do it? Okay. Has anyone ever used Postman before to call a web request? A few of the devs in the room, probably. So if you're a developer, Postman's very popular. Postman is not a Microsoft product. It's just an Amy favorite. Um, but Postman is something that you can just download. Um, wow, Postman doesn't like uh, changing resolution. OK. Well, bear with me. Aha, there we go. Sorry, when it's on my normal screen, I normally see that column. Um, cool, so I'm in Postman. Postman is a wicked tool, it's quite a UI based tool to basically call a web request. So, calling a web request is putting in a URL, often passing it some kind of key that says you have access to whatever service it is. So, in our case, Azure Cognitive Services, and then getting some kind of information back, okay? So we're gonna do what's in that web page with Postman. So one of the things I've put in here is I've basically gone into Microsoft Azure, so this is the Azure portal. I can go to the three little dots at the top and click Create a Resource. I can type in, start typing in Cognitive, and it'll come up with Cognitive Services. It was like, oh, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to create an instance of all of those cognitive services. You get one key for all of them. So you don't have to worry about, oh, but I specifically want to do key phrase extraction, or I all oh, but my partner in the team wants to do the image classification. It's the same key to use. You click create. You fill in this form, so we give it a name. Um, project hack 2 and on that caps. Always go for lowercase, uh, no spaces, as just a general term you know, for naming. Um, your subscription is whatever um, is the subscription that's basically paying for the service. All of this stuff is pay as you go. Um, if you've not used Azure before, I can give you an Azure Pass so you can try it out, and it'll be called something called sponsorship, and that's basically me just giving you some uh, dollar. And then location is the data center that's closest to you. If you choose West US, I cannot be responsible for it taking 10 seconds for it to get that, all of that data across the world and back again with your answer. Always pick a destination that's closest to you. So we do actually have UK data centers. However, for something like a hack, probably use one of our big old data centers in Europe. So that's North Europe and West Europe. That's Dublin and Amsterdam. So in this case, I'm gonna use West Europe. Pricing tier, I only get standard because I've got so many of these. You'll actually get free tier as well, FO. Definitely always choose free if you have that option. 
And then a resource group is a folder. Folder is what you put all your services in. So if I'm creating some kind of cognitive services, I'm going to put it in a folder that's named about my project. So my pro my project or my uh, new resource group might be maybe I'm working on challenge one or something like that. So I'll call it challenge one. Uh, tick any boxes. This is basically saying that uh, what type of data is used and how it's used, but also any services or policies that you can look into. It will go ahead and validate that. So it will check basically that you've chosen things that make sense. And then what you'll notice is it says deployment in progress. So while that's happening, that will literally take a second, but we don't have a second. It will come up with a page like this. So in this page, what you'll notice, there we go, it's created it, is you get a key. The key is yours. The key means that no one else can use your service unless they have that key. That's the security element of it. And then the end point is basically where, see how it says West Europe, that's our data centre, and then api.cognitive, so that's how you basically start calling any of these different services. Also, if you scroll down, documentation. Documentation is key with any cloud service provider because we always, always give tutorials on how to, how to build any of this stuff. We never, it's not, it's not old school documentation, you know, where it's like just reams of different functions or like packages that you can use and you're like, oh God, give me strength. Like, it's not like that. It really is like, how do I use the text analytics API? Here's a tutorial. How do I do this? Here's some sample data that you can use and then edit out your own. So definitely don't be scared of the documentation. Okay, so now we've got a key and an end point. What I can do is we can see here, that's my end point. So we've got our West Europe, we saw that. Then what I want to do is I want to use the computer vision API. So I've got vision, whatever version it is, and I'm going to use this analyze. So analyzing is going to do the thing where it goes and gets me all the tags and description of what's in the image. The GAN skateboard kind of example. If I go into headers, what you'll see is I've put my key in. And then I put that, that key, don't have my key, I'll only delete it later. And, um, and then what type of output it is. Where did I get this from? I got this from, where did you get all the information in the tutorials? Claire? Documentation, winner winner over there. So always, always go to documentation, it gives you sample code. In the body, all I've done is got a picture of me standing by a Christmas tree, because it's the first picture I can find, and then I click send. What this is doing is it's sending off my picture of me standing by a Christmas tree and it's point, pointing it towards that web URL which we've trained, that's a model of trained, passing it back and then it's giving me back all of that horrible, horrible all of that detail, let's call it detail, JSON that is actually key value pair data. So in this case, if you see, it says, ah, in this image there is a Christmas tree and it is 0.99% sure that it is a Christmas tree. There's also a person in it, that person is me. Um, it says Christmas, it says indoors, I'm indoors. I'm also standing by a patio door, it's got a window. It says standing, because I'm standing up. Christmas decorations, Christmas Eve. But if you notice, what is, what's happening here? Christmas Eve is at 0 0.57. So at that point, you probably go, I'm not gonna pass that back to my end user because the algorithm isn't super sure that it's actually the right thing. Christmas Eve is actually, in this case, a little bit irrelevant. It was much earlier than that. I'm someone who puts it up sort of like end of November. So I'm one of those. Uh, holiday ornament as well. But uh, basically what you can see here is you can get loads of great information about what's in an image. Images used to be considered dark data. A bit like those invoices and forms that we talked about. Things where you just know there's so much value in them. But having a person extract that data is so tedious. And so now having these algorithms that can actually extract some of this data, it's the, that's the key. Doing this to lots and lots of different, different documents, using that data and then applying it to something else. So think of Mark's session on Power BI. Once we've got the data out of these dark data resources, that's when it's super useful to start doing you know, visualizations of what's in your data or applying further analytics to it. So never think of machine learning as the end. If anything, it's just a component of a much bigger project. Okay. I get too overexcited about cognitive services because there's so much that they do and we've barely scratched the surface there. I'll show you the computer vision. You can do text analytics as well and definitely go ahead and have a look at the text analytics option. The okay. so who, who oh sorry it's doing that. Uh, 
Um, so who uses this? I thought, well, this is if I'm telling myself, I want to quickly analyse my data and I'm not looking to build my own algorithm. I don't want to do that. I'm a developer maybe, or I'm someone who has someone who can code next to me, but I don't want to have to build it myself. I just need the data out of this piece of text, or I just need the data out of this image. Um, AK.ms slash cognitive services dash pack will take you to some of the documentation. Uh, and get you some sort of more step-by-step -step process of how to build it out. And obviously, ask me as well. I'm here for it. Okay. Yeah. Any more pictures for that picture round? Okay. I'm going to very briefly cover one more thing. We're going to spend a bit of time with the gentleman over there on something called Azure Custom Vision. So I don't know if Vision is a big one at the moment, but in case it is for other things, what we saw was. Um, it said Christmas Eve, for example, or actually I was wearing a jumper, I think, with a penguin on it, and that didn't come across in that query. It didn't say penguin for some reason. Uh, well, I, I think it's because wearing a very stripy scarf, and I'm not sure how many actual penguins in the wild wear stripy scarves. But if it had not picked up that, and I said, well, realistically, what I want from this image is I want to know what's on the jumper. What's the Christmas jumper? What's on the Christmas Definitely jumper, can. for example? Well, in that case, what we might want to do is use pre-built AI, so use a service, but influence it with our own specific question or data. And there's lots of levels in which custom AI, uh, customized pre-built AI is used. But one of the services, and I'll only very briefly show this one, it's called uh, Azure Custom Vision. So if you go to customvision.ai, specification of what it is that you want to classify. So it has all of this knowledge, 
some of it completely irrelevant. There might be a hamburger in there, or a shovel, or like a garden, or something like that. Nothing related to a walrus, but there is probably an animal category. And there is probably a wild animal category, maybe, or there might be a sea animal category, or something like that. And then all you're doing is basically customising that final layer. That's why it can train faster, that's why you can provide it less images. So it's not like crazy magic going on behind the scenes. I would love to tell you it is, it's not. What it is, is a really, really good approach to image classification. Once you've trained it, you can actually test it. And you can just browse for local images, test it, and see how well it does. So then it will give you a percentage per category. So if you have polar bear, walrus, and arctic fox, wasn't it? It will say, this is, I'm 90% sure this is an arctic fox, but it's white and fluffy, so there might be 0.1% that says it's a um, uh, polar bear, and then it says it's definitely not a walrus, 0.00%. Okay, because all it's doing in the images is finding something we call features. So I like to think of that as if you ask lots and lots of pictures of cats, the features it will start to pick out first are just lines. So there might be like a diagonal line like this. And then all of a sudden it will find a diagonal line like this. And then all of a sudden it will realise that there's actually two of these different things. And then it realises there are actually ears that sit on top of a head. And then it realises it has a nose and eyes. And all of a sudden you're building up these things that lots of cats have. But the key thing with image classification that makes it so amazing, or actually in general machine learning, is that you're not explicitly telling it every type of cat in the world, every breed of cat, you don't need to. It will pick features of a cat that are generic. And so when it sees a black cat, and we train it on loads and loads of black cat images, and then it sees a tabby cat, it's not going to be quite as sure. So it's not going to give you a 0.99% probability. It's never seen a tabby cat before, those colouring, those lines that they have. But what it's going to do is it's going to say, well, I have seen ears, eyes, big eyes, uh, tail, four legs, uh, some kind of you know body in the middle. Like That's what it's going to pick up, those features. And that's what makes machine learning powerful. We no longer explicitly program machines, because in the past we tell it everything, everything it needs to do, every rule. We don't tell it what rules it needs to learn, it learns generic rules that it can then associate. What does that sound like? It sounds like how we learn, right? I might not have explicitly seen the hoodie that this gentleman is wearing, but I know that gentleman is wearing a hoodie. It, do, it doesn't, and now I might recognise in the future that is now in my memory. Now when I see that hoodie with that certain logo, I'll be like, I've seen that before. It's exactly that kind of thing. That is what the computer is learning. It's incredible. So that was custom AI. Rather than going in and out of the thing, I hope you don't mind me just kind of crudely going through some of this. So, um, next up is custom AI. Custom AI is then a level deeper, right? We're starting to get into the idea that I really need to understand theory. Has anyone ever heard of garbage in, garbage out? Yeah, massive risk here. So, <laughs> just watch yourself. But basically, custom AI, we call it the 80 20 rule, right? So, we believe. I believe as well, I actually do think this is true, 80% of problems can probably now be solved with, 80% of business problems can sometimes in one part be solved with some kind of pre-built AI. Text analytics, computer vision, custom computer vision in some senses, something that you don't need to go in there deep into Python data or bespoke models or certain packages or actually go right from scratch. There's not many people out there who actually write their own algorithms anymore. That's kind of like machine learning engineers, machine learning researchers. Um, custom AI is that 20%. There is always the 20% where you're going to need something more bespoke. But in machine learning, one of the interesting things is, it's often that you try the service first because it does achieve the problem potentially a lot quicker than writing your own algorithms, training your own algorithms, and then actually the important part, not for this hack, but in the real world, putting them into production and managing them, which is very hard. Um, so one of the things about custom AI is now that the industry is not only focusing on the frameworks that people are using and the algorithms, but also focusing on this full end-to-end -end process. Because it's never just the modeling. I had, a, I had a chat with a gentleman, I did this here actually, um, a really interesting chat where we were saying, yes, the exciting bit of machine learning only this bit. Look at all the other stuff that you have to do in some senses, okay? 
So it's just the experimentation stage. It's the idea that you're going to have to try probably lots of different things, and every time you try it, you have to ask the question, why is it doing that? Why is there that outcome? Because it's the only way you're going to know how to make it better. Okay, so we get into like a real complex area. But what I want to show you, because I don't think it's necessarily useful, I can imagine probably like 10, 15 percent maybe of people are going to be like, yeah, I'd love to put, you know, I'm going to build my own Python model right now, like in two days. Um, and that's cool, like, nice one. But the one I actually want to show you is something that I think is great again for a hack, okay? And it's something called Azure Machine Learning. So when I'm in Azure, I'll do the usual thing, create a resource, type in machine learning, and it'll come up with this canonical. Create the service just like we did with the service. Choose a location, don't put it in US, time, distance, put it in Europe, and then put it into that same resource group, that same folder that you're using. Okay? Once I've created it, what it will say is it'll say go to the studio. This is where I spend most of my time. This is called the Azure Machine Learning Studio. Okay? And so as someone who's not into infrastructure, who just is like, I like to sometimes deem myself as a Sherlock Holmes of data, I get very, very involved in a data set, and I ask lots and lots of questions on it, and I make hypotheses about it, and then I try to solve problems, okay? But what are the things that are interesting to me? That's what all sits in here, not necessarily the infrastructure that sits behind it, okay? But one of the services I specifically want to point out is something called the designer up here. If any of you have used Azure in the past, you might have used something called the Azure Machine Learning Studio, which is very complicated because we now call the whole thing the studio. But um, if you did, it's very, very similar. So what you'll see here is I have this experiment, and it's a very, very graphical way of building a machine learning model. So it's low code or no code if you want to, but technically what it bypasses is some of that like how do I do a for loop in a Python? How do I extract the second to last column of my data, my data frame, you know, my pandas data frame, or something like that? All that googling, you could very quickly build a pretty sort of proof of concept model. Is this actually going to work in something like this? So if I click on this model, actually no, let's, let's create a new one. I'll show you actually from the sort of scratch. So let's zoom out a little bit. This will look better on your screen, I promise. Um, my resolution is up a little bit, that's a little bit too small. There we go, that'll do it. So, uh, this is my workspace, okay, um, and what I can do is I can select something called a computer. So, you have to put some power behind it. Compute in the cloud is key. If you go to the documentation and the tutorial, it will show you how to do all of this. I'm going to give it a name, Project Hack. So, that's come up over here. And then what I've done is I've actually uploaded a data set into here, and it's called forecasting data. So I can click and drag it onto the workspace. It will show me some information about it, but I don't really need to know that for this point. Let's see what we done with it. So we can see we've got our forecasting data. But then after that, what I might want to do, let's close up data sets and let's go to data transformation. What does say? The most part of machine learning is not the exciting bit, the machine learning bit, it's tidying up your data set. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to select columns in my data set, and all you do is you actually connect two different modules, and then you set different metrics. So in this case, I'm going to edit it so that, come on internet, stay with me, by name, uh, and then we can see all the names of my columns in here. So I'm going to say, right, well, I want to keep all of them, but I don't need this time column, because it's not in the right format for me. I might even be doing some kind of mathematics with some data transformation modules, and then remove some of the columns that I've done extra data processing on, for example. That's a very popular approach. <coughs> and I click save. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to split my data. Does anyone know why I'm going to split my data? What am I going to split it into? Two types of data sets. <laughs> Training and either verification, validation, or, or test set, people call them. Yeah, many, many words for that one. But basically, training data is what your algorithm and model learns from. Keep back some of the data. Don't train on all of your data. Because if you then are trying to test out what your model is, and you're giving it the same data that it's actually been able to learn on, 
you're not you're not tasking it right we're not doing the, the black cats having cat ginger cat thing what we're doing is we're just saying yeah i've seen that exact piece of information the computer goes yeah i know exactly what this is a fool like so what you need to do is keep some of that back it's almost like a deck of cards and then you go okay here's the question what have you got and then the computer puts down its hands and then you put down your hand and if they match that's good if they don't then it's not quite the, the right thing okay that's how i always visualize it a very very long card game but basically i'm going to then put 70 percent so i'm actually going to put the majority of my data into this output and then the other 30 percent is going to be my test data and it will go in the other one uh, then we can go down to things like machine learning algorithms and this is when we have to know what question we're asking of our data so in this case i've done a forecasting problem and i'm trying to forecast so it's actually a regression problem how much or how many an item, a physical number, um, whereas something like classification is a bit more like the, the cat or the arctic fox type thing. It's is it this, is it that, or is it this specific categories to put them into? Okay. So what we're going to do, do a bit of regression on that: how much or how many. And so what I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose our boosted decision tree regression. How do I know how to choose that? It's a very very good thing, a question to ask. That's where machine learning theory is still paramount. The understanding or the respect of why we're choosing certain things. Because algorithms are all designed differently. But at the end of the day, they're all mathematical equations at the heart of them. And so the interesting piece is just knowing that, oh, people in this area of machine learning have used this type of algorithm and it's become very, very popular, for example. Um, image classification, convolutional neural networks are one of the most popular current ways to do image classification. Doesn't mean it's the only way, there's lots and lots of different ways to do it. But there's certain things that you just learn when you actually have experience in a certain area. Just like I am not a web developer. So if you started talking to me about web frameworks, I would look a little bit lost. It's exactly the same kind of thing, right? You just need to spend that time learning and trying and reading. There actually is a really cool piece of documentation, I think I might link to it actually at the end, where um, someone at Microsoft has actually gone ahead and described all of the algorithms that we in this tool, but in, I'm going to say like plain English, which sounds bad, but not in the mathematical formula sense. It gives a bit of a higher level overview of when it might be useful to use this type of algorithm. It by no means it works on every data, but it tries to just give you that, that broad level 100 knowledge before you research further into one and find out more about it. Okay? But yeah, let's, uh, let's go back to one. Here's one I made earlier like uh, Blue Peter. Blue Peter's still on. Um, but this is what it then looks like later. So what did we do? We selected columns, we split our data, we chose our algorithm, but then what we do is bring on this trained model. Let's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit on this. So we have, our, we have our algorithm, and algorithm is a mathematical equation. We have our data, and then what you'll notice is algorithm and the training data go into this train model and on train model we choose the column name that we want it to learn say you wanted it to learn house price value okay given number of bedrooms square footage of garden does it have a garage does it have a wine fridge i don't know like all of the things that write put value on your house i can see the train and that puts value on your house um that's what it will start to learn from, but it will focus on predicting the actual value of the house, okay? So it takes the algorithm, and then it takes each piece of data, and it, it gives it to the algorithm. It says, learn that, learn that, learn that, learn that. And each time it learns something new, there's something called weights in, in, a, in each formula that get tweaked. So every time it sees a new piece of data, it says, oh, actually, when I see that it has more bedrooms, the high price is, uh, is higher. So when it's less bedrooms, it's actually lower. But then, then there's exceptions to the rule, right? What if it's, and then it says, oh, if it's in this postcode, it's much higher. If it's in this postcode, it's much lower. Stuff like that. And so it, it tweaks and it learns on every single piece of data. Then we need to score the model. What do we say? Card game, right? So we then, out of the bottom of here, we hover over this. It says trained model basically. I don't know why I'm asking to hover over it. Trained model. Trained model. That's your model. 
That's not an algorithm anymore. That is something called a model. That is your the algorithm you chose and then your data. And those two things together with all those weights that are edited, that's your machine learning model. That's a spoke to the question that you've asked it using your data. Okay? So no one else can use that. You can't ask that to make a cup of tea. You can't ask it to tell it is this a picture of a cat or not. It can't do anything but what you've trained it to do. And so this is really again like I'm I'm sorry, I'm just like taking all the magic away in some senses. This area is not unicorn dust, it's mathematics. That's all it is. Yeah, so all it does is just understand and learn from your data, but we have really amazing ways to now do that and very powerful computer right now. So we score our model, we evaluate it, but basically what you can do is you can just click things like the train button and it will go ahead and do all of this for you. You don't have to tell it what computer to run it on, what what operating system. At the end of the day as a data scientist, in most cases, I don't care as long as you run it. Okay? As long as I get some kind of answer back and I can start evaluating what the answer means. So, really, really nice uh, sort of tool. It's very interesting for hackathons. You can take the output of something like this and if you had more designated time to go and tune hyperparameters that bear the weights uh, and the different parts of the model, learning rate and stuff like that we call it, that's when maybe going out to the code makes much more sense. Okay? But for something like this to prove out whether these questions that you're asking of your data are actually doable, do you have what we call signal in your data? We call it signal because sometimes data sets are so messy they can't answer the question you're asking them of it. Okay? So um, Azure Machine Learning Designer this is called uh, and I'll give you some links now actually. So here we go. Who would use this? I want to build an experiment with a bespoke machine learning model. And if you want to take a look at what we just looked at there, it's this link. So it's called aka.ms visual interface dash hack. And that will take you to some documentation, follow through, and then edit for your own scenario. Okay? Underneath it, we also have something called automated machine learning. Has anyone heard of automated machine learning before? Automated machine learning? Yes, nice. Automated machine learning is super interesting in the industry right now. It's basically efficiency. Because what we do is I build that one model, but we will forever and a day go over and tweak that model like 300 million times. Or even choosing the right algorithm to use. There are so many out there. There's so many different types of things we call loss functions. So the way we actually measure whether it's any good or not. And we try all these different things. It takes a long time, you have to write all the code for that. Automated machine learning can do a little skip step basically, where you submit your data set, you tell it what type of problem you're trying to solve, so is it a regression problem, and what is that column that you want it to learn, and it will go away, and it will go and check lots of different algorithms, and lots of different hyperparameter setups, and lots of different loss functions. And then it will come back with a list of them, and it will say ranked, and it will say these ones did the best, and then it will rank them all the way down to the ones that actually fail because some of them won't run because they don't suit the data. If, if that's something that's of interest, if you're in the kind of space and you know a little bit more about like regression classification, definitely check out automated machine learning. A couple of other things I'd just like to mention. You've seen a lot of something like uh, Power BI today, so I'm not going to go over that one again. But Microsoft Power BI, what's it for? I want to analyze and explore my data. I want to share my findings with everyone. Okay, so if you think that the outcome, the best outcome of your challenge is to get up there, dashboard, get people asking you questions of your data that you can actually explore in real time, Power BI is your friend. Okay? And uh, Mark and Rishi did a wicked job of kind of showing how you can think and ask those right questions of your data in that case. One of the projects talked about Microsoft Power App. Now, like I said, I'm not a web or an app developer. I, I did it in the past, pure computer science degree, did a bit of everything right and then specialised. But, one of the interesting things is, I am, I am no snob. If I don't need to code an app, and all I need is to build my machine learning model into something that someone can physically use very, very quickly, and actually show where machine learning lands in the real world. Because, what comes out of machine learning? A number, what, what's that number called? a probability, so that's 0 0.9, 0 0.57, yeah? 
that's what comes out of the machine in the ambulance. Can you imagine? Well, actually, oh, this is a sweeping statement, but can you imagine going to your like senior leadership team and then going <gasps> 0 0.88 and they go, get out? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's levels of detail for certain people, right? And Power Apps is something that I have found very interesting in these use cases to show this stuff in real life. When I'm talking about taking pictures of cats, I'm talking about taking pictures of cats like properly. So showing people that this stuff is real, right? So I created this app. Um, it's on my phone. I've not used it in a while actually. Um, I had this whole thing at one point where I was like, I do so much online shopping on my security cameras. Yeah, yeah, on the screen. Okay, so it's using the camera on my laptop, but if it was on my phone, it'd be using the camera on my phone. Um, iPhone, not worrying about what platform you're on. Um, and one of the interesting things is, I wrote no code. Like, I wrote like some Excel type code to get basically get the camera to send the image and then for me to use that image to call an API. That was literally it. And I was like, this is a dream. Like, do you know how long it would have taken me to learn like a web framework to create like a very simple website? And it wasn't about the impact that it did, that when I walk into different conferences and I can like literally ask someone, can I borrow your jacket? Take a picture of a jacket and it'll come back and it'll add it to my little portfolio of jackets and I use custom vision, the service that we did. So think of Power Apps as a really nice, like GUI based, design a quick app, putting amazing things like cameras like that, putting toggle buttons like that, like no worries, and actually focus on the machine learning like that a little bit, but also hackathons. This stuff is a dream, but it's bigger than that. This stuff's being used everywhere. One of our best stories is Heathrow Airport. I think it was someone who was originally, I don't think they are anymore, it was originally a language boat, created power up, so it just made his life a lot easier. It makes processes easier, you can connect different workflows, it doesn't have to, even have to be machine learning. You can connect it to like your Outlook, or um, you can get it to send you notifications or something like that. It's very, very cool, uh, definitely go and take a look at power apps if you're going to do an sort of end point for, you, for your final demo. So, Power Apps, what is it? I want to show how insights and models can be used in real life. Uh, not that percentage point, but what's it actually look like in real life? So, aka.ms slash power apps dash hack. Let's take a picture of I'm at time, so I'm going to show you one more thing and then mention something that some of you might want to look to. So, how many people do we have who are looking at coding in Python? Oh, okay. Can I have five more minutes of your time? Do you mind? I feel like I've got consensus and nods. Okay. So one of the things I want to show you is something called Azure Notebooks. Okay? Notebooks.azure.com. Great for a hack. Okay? So what do I want to do? I want to quickly get up and running with Jupyter Notebooks and Python code. You might have that on your device, but maybe you want to run it on more powerful compute. Azure Notebooks is like a super interesting way of doing it. Also, if you're cloning Git repositories and your trusty machine is getting a little bit heavy on memory and uh, storage, this is a nice thing because it also is the cloud. Okay? So, Azure Notebooks, let me show you what Azure Notebooks are like. Let me close that because my camera gets a bit. Okay. This is Azure Notebooks. In fact, what I'm going to do is show you what it looks like on the main page notebooks.azure.com. It goes to a page like this, so develop and run code from anywhere with Jupyter. So Jupyter is, a, we love Jupyter at Microsoft and in Azure specifically. We know that a lot of data science people use Jupyter. It's very, very popular. Jupyter, um, Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, R Studio, stuff like that. Like, we get it. And so what we've done is just made it really, really easy for you to very quickly log in get some projects in a UI so you don't have to actually think about like normally if you're in Jupyter in the cloud it's like get a virtual machine, log into it and you might be totally comfortable with that and that's cool but in case you're just looking for a very quick way to do a little bit of analysis in Jupyter what you can do is you can create a project so you can go new project, give it a name once you've got a project, so say I've got this AI and machine learning learning path what you can see is it says run on free compute what? Nothing's free in this life, right? But this is actually true, it is free compute. So notebooks has been very, very popular in the academic space. Okay, so a lot of students use notebooks.ish.com because they can get access to free compute. It is not going to be the most powerful compute, right? 
But if you do want that, we can give it you for a price. But the <laughs> one of the exciting bits here is you still have a terminal. Because a lot of people are like, oh, UIs. You are your way out of here, command line's my home place and all of that kind of good stuff. Don't worry, we've got you covered. So anything that you could normally do in a Linux virtual machine that you're running Jupyter on, you can run the terminal in here and do exactly the same thing. So if I wanted to git clone something, I could, that's not a problem. And that's actually what I've done right here. So I've git cloned um, this repository here, which I'm working on. So it's all these different AI sessions that we run and all the code. And if I go to AIML21, which I know has some code in it that I don't want to run. So we'll get some code folder. There we go. Um, and we go to explore. What you'll notice, who's Jupiter? What's this like? Jupiter. Uh, choose your kernel. I always choose the latest version, but I totally understand if you have certain packages you use and use all the versions of Python. Um, and then what you can do, Jupyter Notebooks, for those who don't know what they are, very, very popular because you can do inline markup, so you can explain what is going on in your code. Code commenting, I know we hate it, it's a cleanser thing, but with data it's amazing because any insight that I find, I write in there. What is this code doing? But not just what is this code doing, because there's so much more analysis that happens after that. Not what the code does, it's what, I, what questions I ask of it what insights I glean from that data. So you can really like note this kind of stuff down so that when you come to it tomorrow and you've been at the drinks tonight, you still remember what it was that you found out in your data, okay? And then what you can do is you can do control enter and it actually runs the code in line like a script and then it keeps variables there for you so you can reuse them below, you can do anything that you can do in Python in there, um, because you can install a package in the terminal if it's not already on there, a lot of it will be on there. Things like Pandas is on there, things like um, Matplotlib is on there, for example. Um, and then, as you can see, you get all your inline data. So if notebooks is your thing, you're looking for a little bit of compute or a little extra storage if you've got that data hanging around, it's a nice one to think about, notebooks.azure.com. And then finally, I just wanted to mention storage accounts because they are they are the beyond them all of Azure, I'll be honest. They underline everything that we do, Azure storage accounts, and block storage is object storage. And in most cases of data science, I find myself using not just structured data, which is something like SQL, but actually a lot of unstructured data like images, or um, CSV files, or etc, etc, etc. PDFs, folds recognize that I mentioned. Service. Um, but basically, if you're looking to create a basic storage account, click on create a resource, type in storage. Oh, she says, there we go, storage account, blog, file, table, queue. Different types of basic storage that we have. Storage on the cloud does not cost you like anything, it's like pennies, so don't worry about the price of this. If you're running virtual machines in Azure, before you leave today, press stop shut down, saves you loads of money, okay, and then you just press start tomorrow morning, and then you have access to it, you didn't pay for anything whether you were sleeping or drinking. So, uh, what do we do? We create a storage account just like we did before, right, so we give it a subscription, we give it a resource group, so we have a project hack right in here, here we go. We give it a name, all lowercase, the name of your storage account, the way you access your storage account is via a web URL and a token or access control. Okay, so that name of that storage account has actually got to be unique. Yeah, so don't all create the same storage account with the same name. I run workshops sometimes, and it is quite funny when like, everyone uses exactly the same name that I use, and then they're like, it doesn't work. And like, it does. Put your initials on the end of it. Oh, it works. So, uh, storage account name is unique because it's a URL. So, it's a URI, right? You. What's that example? It's, it's something indicator. Universal resource indicator? Yeah. That... Identifier. Identifier. Yeah. We're going off this there. URL, right? So a link, a unique link, an address that only that goes to that single place. Yeah? So once we create all of that, and you literally just fill in this first bit and click review and create, you don't need to do any of the extra stuff when you're at a hat. What you'll notice if we go to, so if I type in storage accounts here, yeah, you'll see lots of storage accounts that I already have. I don't know what 
don't have to hand that you own. Um, so in here, I have basically got this storage account. I've got two folders in there. Uh, one's for data and one's for images. If I go into data, there is nothing in there. That's brilliant. Um, we might have CSV files in there or something like that. Now, one of the things you'll notice at the top level of this is it will say, open in Explorer. Now, I'm all about a lovely web browser. I'm super keen on it. I'm also about the code. I'm pretty savvy in Postman. Get you know, get about with a, with a URL and a web request, but there is something called the Azure Storage Explorer that also really doesn't like my resolution. There we go. And in the Azure Storage Explorer, basically you can connect to your Azure account from a local machine. So you can see this is an app that runs on on Windows, Linux, and Mac. So don't worry about that. Uh, and then we can see under my subscription, which I've been using here, if I drop it down. last bit, I promise. When I drop it down, it will come up with a list of all my storage accounts. Here they are. Um, and what else is going to have something in it? My wardrobe will have something in it. I've got lots of images in it. And we go under blob containers. Blobs are objects, CSVs, images, etc. And if we go into images, it then just becomes like file explorers. Anyone use like FileZilla before? Just reminds me a bit of that. But it's a little friendlier looking, as far as I like, 90s central. But it's um, it's basically just got all of the different things that I've basically taken a picture of with that wardrobe app and entered. You can see why I do this at like conferences because they're all just called absolute goods, don't do that. But the um, the key thing here is I can literally then just go upload, download, copy the URL if I need to use it in a web request. It's just super easy to access each item because it's all web stuff, right? But it's just through a bit of a nicer interface. So Azure Storage Explorer it's called, and you can download it on your machine. So where do I have Storage Explorer? Here we go. So Azure Storage Explorer, um, you literally just, just type Azure Storage Explorer to Google. The first thing that will come up is, is that URL. And I see that as I want to share data and have a really easy way to access it. Okay. So, this one I will put up, got lots of great links. Thank you for joining me. I know that's been a bit of a whoa, like what, how many different things. I hope that what you mainly took from that was we're doing text analytics, but she said Cognitive Services can do that. Yes, like, go and try that out. Go and get that short link. Um, and go and try it, right? Go and do the tutorial. Oh, is it? Sorry. This is our accessibility thing, so you can actually have it translate in real time. Translate? I'm not that northern. Um, <laughs> it can uh, do your, your voice to text. We actually do it for accessibility purposes a lot. Um, but yeah, one of the interesting things here, take down some of these PAL apps, like I said. Fantastic, like really, really cool, and especially for headphones. Um, Azure Machine Learning, the visual interface that I showed you. If you're gonna, if you want to get into the theory, this is a cool place to try out some of those skills, um, and that's a nice, a nice service to try it out with. Um, Azure Notebooks, Python code is your thing. Uh, Power BI, we've already seen a lot of that. We're super popular with data analytics. I love it. I still use it as my output tool, even once I'm doing all that data analytics in notebooks. But yeah, thank you very much for joining us. If you're interested and you want access to Azure for some monetary value, um, let me know. I've got some codes and, uh, and you can start flying with it. So yeah, thanks very much. <laughs>